Mr. Jim Pop up here. Normally when Jim comes up, we're getting scolded for something. So I don't know what he's going to say today. Good morning. Good morning. No, I have nothing scolding about today. Oh, shoot. Uh, first of all, I, uh, it's amazing to me that uh, in my present condition, how everybody has stepped up and really helped out all over. And I can't thank you guys enough for doing that. That really makes my heart feel very, very good. But I do want to say, this past Monday, between John and Joan, would you stand up, and Fran, they cleaned this church like I would have done it normally. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming in and spending that good hour and a half coming in and cleaning everything in this church. Thank you so very, very much. I appreciate it. Ah, and Jim's uh, condition, you know, usually when you hear that, it's means a lady's pregnant. <laughs> but he, he, he broke his humorous bone, bone, so that's his condition. I just you trying to be funny? Well, you know, <laughs> the, these days you never know, you know. That's true. That is true. All right. Well, it's that time of year. I know you've all been waiting, right? So whether it's your first time here, which we're thrilled 
of all of you that is your first time today. Uh, we want to invite you and everybody else uh, to our Thanksgiving, special Thanksgiving service next week at the same time at 10.30, of course, but we have a uh, special Thanksgiving potluck afterwards. So I know we eat a lot all the time, actually, in the family <laughs> tree, don't we? All the time. But this is extra special because you all are going to participate in bringing something, right? Of course. So I'm going to start this sign-up sheet over there. And this uh, it's next Sunday, so it's one week. So we just want to get an idea what everybody's thinking about bringing. So don't forget, bring your potluck item next week, OK? Pastor Bill's already signed up, but no. All right. Uh. And uh, we are also, of course, just a reminder that our on Wednesday nights, we have a uh, service or a Bible studies more informal at uh, 6.30. And we're going through a series by, by Dr. David Jeremiah about all about heaven. And if you think you know everything about heaven, you don't. It's <laughs> you need to come and find out. I'm learning all kinds of things. It's so great. So please join us uh, Wednesday nights at 6.30. All right. Then the third announcement is the potluck, I believe. All right. So... I'm still using my phone because my printer <laughs> is not working too well at home. So give me a second here. Technology, not my specialty. Well, you know what? I'm just going to do. All right. So yeah, December 15th, uh, the middle of December is our Christmas party. Yes, that's always a fun one, too. Uh, we're going to have a $15 uh, gift exchange. We'll tell you more of the details, but we've been doing this kind of a, a Four Seasons tradition, too. It'll be a potluck, and that'll be a lot of fun. So please put that date on your calendar. And then lastly, we just want to uh, kind of get you thinking that uh, we love feeding our own faces, but it's really the holidays are so much more about the Lord and about honoring him and celebrating the birth of Jesus and blessing others, right? Giving to others. So we want to, as we've been doing for a lot of years, honor the uh, men of Teen Challenge and the ladies of the Hoving Home. And they usually don't get too much for Christmas. And we've had a tradition of giving um, everyone kind of adopting, whoever wants to adopt a lady or a guy in Teen Challenge or the Hoving Home and bless them by making a donation so our church can give a gift card to each and every one of them. And I can tell you from years past that it is so touching to see these women and men get this gift card because this enables them sometimes to buy some gift things for their children, for their family, and they get emotional and then we get emotional. It's really beautiful. So think about, I know it's a, it's a challenging time of year financially usually, but if the uh, Hoving Home, um, we're asking is for a $75 donation, if you'd like to adopt one of those women, or $50 for a Teen Challenge guy, or $100 for one of the leaders. So we'll have a sign-up sheet next week where you can sign up if you're able to do that. But it's, it's a blessing to them, and it's a blessing to us in return. Okay, Pastor Fran. Bill. Oh yeah, Miss Fran is going to lead us. In prayer. I do? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Fran. Yeah. So also in Four Seasons tradition, uh, we're planning on having a Christmas bake sale boutique kind of thing. And we want you all, of course, to help us by making uh, baked goods or whatever you guys make. You are all so talented out there. And we're raising money for women's ministries. So it's a very good cause. So that's coming up, too. So get your uh, ovens preheated, right? <laughs> All right, now, Miss Fran. Hi, guys. <laughs> How's everybody? Good. Where's our uh, the visitors? Welcome, welcome. We're always happy to see new people in church, so uh, we're very happy you found us, and we hope you make us your church home. Okay, um, so <laughs> as you guys know, I've been a little busy with uh, the popster over there. <laughs> and I was supposed to be prepared this morning, and I'm not, so I have to apologize. So I'm just going to say, let's uh, go ahead and do the Lord's Prayer at this point, and uh, then we'll continue on with the wonderful sermon from Pastor Bell. <laughs> 
Okay? Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Well, we're continuing looking at Bible stories for God's children. We started a number of months back just looking at uh, a lot of the Bible stories that we remember as children, but there's so much more, of course, to all these uh, stories than just what we were introduced uh, to as children. Those were good things. And today's lesson is when no one is looking. And actually, the full title should be, Who Are You When No One Is Looking? Ooh. Ooh. I always thought it'd be so cool if they had sort of a, a Christian candid camera. And during the week, unbeknownst, there'd be a, just a camera that would follow around and record you in line at the grocery store, you in the car, you with your family, you when you're all by yourself. And then you'd never know, and you just show up for church, and then the, there'd be a screening, and everybody gets to watch it, you know. Thank God we don't have that, right? <laughs> but we should, because the eyes of the Lord are on us all the time. You know, we're always concerned about what, what we're doing in front of people, but God knows what we're doing. So for the last two Sundays, we've looked at Joseph. We were looking at Joseph as a teenager. Uh, and uh, we looked at that coat of many colors. You know, that's the story we all remember in, in Sunday school. And, and as a teenager, Joseph had this wonderful advantage of having his father's love. He was his dad's favorite. And that pretty much set him up for being rejected and hated by his ten older brothers. And uh, we also know that he made some mistakes like teenagers do. I know I did as a teenager. And at 70, I'm still making plenty of mistakes. But not, not the same kind as I did as a teenager, you know. I don't have to take the car keys without my parents knowing, you know. <laughs> but Joseph, with the situation going on, while his brothers resented him for being the favorite, he showed off that coat of many colors. He kind of bragged about it. And then he bragged about these wonderful dreams that God gave him of the future. And he just exacerbated the situation. And he wound up in, in a pit. So let's pray as uh, we find Joseph in that pit and getting ready to come out of that pit. Father God, we thank you for this time together and we're so grateful for your word, for the power that's in your word and the, the power that your word has to change our lives. And we're so thankful for you, Holy Spirit, that you have a way of touching our hearts that I can't as a human being. So Lord, I just pray your anointing be on each word of this sermon today and you'll touch hearts in the way you intend to touch those hearts. And you just get us in line, Father. You'll hear us, help us to hear exactly what you would speak to us. We ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're in Genesis chapter 39. We're going to read uh, 20 verses today. Uh, Genesis 39. And we are at the point where Joseph's brother took him out of the pit. And we pick up there in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. 
with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard his, the story his wife had told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now we're going to backtrack just a little bit because, again, Joseph was a 17-year-old boy and he was living a pretty comfortable life as a teenager. His dad was wealthy and he'd been given that fancy coat by his dad and I'll bet that that wasn't the only favor his dad did for him as a, as a favorite, you know? Maybe when uh, they were serving goat burgers, <laughs> the other brothers got two goat burgers and Jacob would slip a third to Joseph. You know, I don't know. He probably had his own sleeping tent, you know, his own bedroom. The other brothers probably had to share. I don't know, but he was favored. And then the Lord gave him these two wonderful dreams of all, the his, of, all of his brothers just bowing to him. He's going to be in a position of authority. And wouldn't we love if God would give us those kinds of dreams. Can you imagine as a teenager being given that kind of dream? Imagine if God gave you a dream of your future and it, as a, just 17 years old and you saw yourself coming back to your 10-year reunion and in a chauffeur-driven driven limousine and all your school friends bowing to you, taking pictures, you know, wanting to be with you, you know. That's heady, heady stuff. It was heady stuff for Joseph and it appeals to the fleshy nature but God doesn't promote the flesh if you know anything about following the Lord that just doesn't work out so God gives Joseph these dreams but he doesn't fill him in on the training schedule on the preparation on the grooming that's going to have to take place before he reaches that position remember we've talked other weeks about how with the Lord your character is the foundation of your destiny and that it's the tests that develop your character and you need strong character for your destiny because destiny means greater responsibility. You know, Abraham Lincoln is, in the opinion of many in this nation, and in my opinion, of course, one of the greatest public figures in our national history. He was an effective politician, a great leader, and yet he was a deeply compassionate man. And his character was developed by many tests and setbacks on his way to his destiny and on the way to the presidency. He was raised in poverty. He was self-educated. His mother died when he was only nine years old. That would be old enough to really feel that loss. He lost a job in 1932. 1832. He was defeated for the state legislature in 1832. He failed in business in 1833. He was elected to the state legislature in 1834. My niece Brittany here, he needs to hear these details. His sweetheart died in 1835. In 1836, he had a nervous breakdown. He was defeated for speaker in 1838. He was defeated for nomination to Congress in 1843. He was elected to Congress in 1846. He lost the nomination in 1848. He was rejected for land officer in 1849. He was defeated for the U.S. Senate in 1854. He was defeated for nomination for vice president in 1856. He was again defeated for U.S. Senate in 1858. 
He was elected president in 1860. You know, we love the dreams, don't we? And the dreams are beautiful, and the dreams propel us toward our God-given destiny. And God gave Joseph this dream, but again, he did not tell him the course he was going to be taking for quite a number of years before those dreams were fulfilled. Now, why did God give him those dreams, and why didn't God give him an itinerary of what he was going to face? You'll be a great ruler. Well, probably if he got the schedule of what was going to happen after those dreams, he would have stayed home, you know. Well, you're going to be thrown into a pit, you know. <laughs> I think I'd have stayed home, you know. The good news is you're going to be taken out of that pit, but you're going to be sold to the Midianites, and the Midianites are going to sell you to Potiphar, you know. And you'll be a slave for the next 22 years. You'll be separated from your father. You'll be separated from your home. You'll be in a dungeon for years. You'll be forgotten by a man you helped in that dungeon. You'll be stuck there for another two years longer than you wanted to be. Maybe some of you had a dream in here of a certain career, a certain business, and you, and you followed that dream, and, and you saw that destiny fulfilled, but you, saw, you faced a lot of heartbreaks and a lot of setbacks and a lot of uh, trouble. You know, Can I get an amen on that? Probably some of you know just what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. The dreams I had when I was 19 years old of a career in show business were exhilarating. And boy, I could just see, you know, oh, I'm going to be up on stage. Everybody wants that, don't they? That spotlight, yeah. No? Uh, well, I did. <laughs> and I could see myself coming back to that 10-year reunion, that 20-year reunion and all that. that good, and then hanging out with all those exciting show business people, you know. Well, I found out otherwise they're not that exciting along the way. <laughs> Very disappointing. It's amazing. You meet these people that you see on TV and think, wow, hear the language they use. And we worked with Sherry Lewis. Remember Sherry Lewis? Oh, she was great. Such a talent. And we were little kids sitting in front of our TV set back in the 1950s and early 60s watching Sherry with Lamb Chop and Charlie Horse. And she was amazing. This was in the 1980s. Uh, we were did a convention, and she just was like the best ventriloquist, and she conducted orchestras, amazing talent, and gone too soon. But on the way to the airport, uh, she was running late, and she used a tiny bit of profanity, and just, huh, huh. you know, I'd use that word, but Sherry Lewis, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I had that dream at 19, and, and and it was fulfilled. We had a career for 30 years, and it was, we had many, many exhilarating moments, but we also had a lot of heartaches and rough patches and a few nightmares along the way. And, uh, but, you know, I, that wasn't in the tiny print when I signed up for the program when I was 19 years old. So we're given a glimpse into Joseph's training camp on the way from the pit to the palace, and the first stop is Potiphar. Did I spray you, Gary? <laughs> I meant to, yeah. <laughs> little, little pastoral baptism, yeah. <laughs> so that's why people don't sit in the front, uh, generally. Uh, so the first thing we read in Genesis is how he's taken out of that pit and sold to the Midianites, and then he ends up in the house of Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers. And in ancient Egypt, it was a land of, of, of great contrasts. I mean, either people were rich beyond measure or they were desperately poor, poverty stricken. And, and Joseph is serving Potiphar and he is extremely rich as a, a servant of Pharaoh's in the Pharaoh's court. And rich families like Potiphar's had elaborate homes and they had beautiful gardens and they ate rich and wonderful food and they enjoyed live entertainment right in their houses because they didn't have TV in those days. So you just bring the entertainment to you and they surrounded themselves with beauty alabaster vases and paintings and beautiful rugs and hand-carved furniture and dinner was served on golden plates and golden utensils so we must appreciate that young Joseph is being tested he's been heartily rejected by his ten older brothers and he's dragged away by the Midianites the Hamas of that day and he's away from all that's familiar 
all this comfortable, away from his dad and his younger brother. And he had to learn a new language and he had to adjust to a different culture and eat different foods. But it's a bad situation regardless. And the Lord was, we're reading Genesis 39 two. the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. It's interesting that we read during Joseph's time of testing that the Lord was with him. You see this in this situation of Potiphar's house as a slave. You see it, we'll see it next, uh, in a couple of weeks when we see Joseph going into the dungeon. And when the dream is fulfilled and people are bowing down to him, we don't read that phrase anymore because we don't need it, right? We don't need it anymore. Because, you know, when you think, when you're going through a hard time, you know, you feel like, God, where are you? You know that, right? Haven't you felt that way? God, I don't know where you are. I have, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, that's a prayer of faith. That's not a prayer of faithlessness because you know, you know, God, you just can't, what's going on here? That's another place for an amen. 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 Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. When you're going through a really tough time, it seems like the end of the world, doesn't it? Oh, I've, I've, I know what I'm talking about. I know you do too. And when the test is over, you know, and you're experiencing the sun is shining, the birds are singing, everything's right with your family, you've got some money in the bank, you get an email from Chili's and on your next visit you get a free appetizer. <laughs> you don't need to be reminded that God is with you. Yes, you know. So let's look at the positive side of Joseph's situation as a slave. First of all, his brothers did not kill him. That was the original plan. Secondly, we read that he's living in Potiphar's mansion. He's not working in the fields. He's not living in a mud hut, you know. And then we read that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did. And we read that Potiphar put him in charge of the entire household. And... And as a bonus, we read this in 39.6. Joseph was well built and handsome. So few of us are cursed with that kind of a situation. <laughs> now, I always give... <laughs> I hate when laughter erupts after a line like that. Now, I always give people that, that following counsel when they come to me with, a, a problem you know they tell me that you know that, which understandably it's you lose a job that's scary or you get a, a bad report from the doctor so I always tell them look at every give God thanks and bless him for every positive thing you can think of Amen. you know if you lost a job and I've heard this many times. Oh, I've lost this job, and I only have this much. And so I'll say, well, is your, is your rent paid? Is your mortgage paid this month? Are your bills paid? Yeah, okay. You have a roof up? You have food in the house? You have a, a little money in a bank account? You know, every single thing. Because even if you only have enough to live on for a month, that's a month to get another job, you know. Or if it's an illness, if you have a husband or wife that's there to help you, a friend, a family member, thank God for that, you know. Thank God that you were detected, that this thing was found, whatever it is, you know. So, things are going well, as they can for Joseph, as a slave in Egypt. The Lord's with him. He's working in a luxurious environment. Potiphar recognizes that blessing of God on him and promotes him. And, and by the way, it says that he had favor. The Lord gave Joseph favor. You know, we are favored and you should approach every situation you have in life as, I am favored. I am favored. You are favored. So Potiphar's household prospers because of Joseph, but, and this is your big Egyptian but, but, bum bum ba. We read in 39, 6, now Joseph was well built and handsome. 7, after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. Come on to my house, my house. I'm going to give you candy. Come on to my house, my house. 
I'm going to give you apple and a plum and an apricot or two. Come on, am I my Nobody remembers Rosemary Clooney. That's sad. Uh, Joseph is being tempted by Mrs. Potiphar. And here's to you, Mrs. Potiphar. Jesus loves you more than you will know. Just bring out some of your favorites. Now, whoa, 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 remember that. I think Joseph was a little bit older than 17 at this point, because it says after a while. He's been in the house, he's been serving for a while, and it took a little while before uh, Potiphar would notice that this guy is a cut above all the other servants, so he was, so it's a while. Maybe he's 18, 19, 20, you know. Maybe it doesn't really matter, but he's a young man. And something worth noticing in this situation, I came across a note in my Henry Morris Bible study. I don't know if he's in relation to Don and Veronica Morris, but Henry Morris. <laughs> and he said this, he mentioned that the word translated official or officer in the Bible means eunuch. Do I have to draw you a picture? <laughs> so, if you held high position in Pharaoh's court, you were castrated. So that maybe that explains why Potiphar's wife felt a little neglected, you know. <laughs> it doesn't excuse it. There's nothing worse. And she wants him in bed, and when he won't go, she accuses him falsely. Have you ever been accused falsely of something? It's, it's the pits. I was in first grade, five or six years old, and I came home for lunch. We, we lived on the top of the hill in this uh, area of all these uh, mid-century homes, all these young families my, uh, uh, bought in this brand new neighborhood. And the school was at the bottom of the hill. We walked down the hill and we'd have uh, school until lunchtime. And then we'd walk up the hill and we'd have lunch and then we'd walk back down for the afternoon classes. So I was like five, six years old in first grade. And the phone rings while I'm eating my sandwich at the table. And my mother uh, gets a phone call from Mrs. McDonald down the street. Uh, she was my piano teacher. And Jennifer, her little girl, was my good friend. And we'd walk up and down the hill together. So she, my, Mrs. McDonald's talking to my mother. And apparently my mother turns to me and said, Billy, did you tell Jennifer you'd give her five cents, you'd give her a nickel if she pulled down her pants? And trust me, people, I wasn't a Christian then, but I didn't do it. <laughs> so I, I said, no, no. And my mother kept quizzing me. You sure you didn't tell Jennifer? Because Mrs. McDonald said, Jennifer said that Billy said he'd give a nickel. She pulled on her <laughs> pants. So anyway, I swore up and down, and my mother uh, quizzed me and questioned me, and then finally hung up. And I'm just sitting there, you know, I'm being accused, and I, I didn't do it. So the phone rang about five minutes later, and it was Mrs. McDonald again. And apparently it was Billy Jones that offered the nickel, <laughs> not Billy Walker. <laughs> but my heart, you know, stopped. And, you know, I just couldn't believe my mother not believing me. Because there was no way I'd pay that kind of money for a peep show. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's rotten, you know. Now, Genesis 39, 7, in the King James reads this way, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Sexual immorality begins with the eyes. With the eyes. That's how it starts. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard it said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Remember, Jimmy Carter made it plain that he had lusted in his heart. You know, and everybody was so shocked that a president that grew peanuts would, you know, that would and taught Sunday school would lust. So sexual immorality begins with the eyes. At first it's looking and then it's lusting. And then it's 
adultery or immorality. And you know, one of the biggest sin areas now so easy is uh, internet porn. Even Christian men, it's so easy. It's so accessible. I can't imagine being a teenager today. You know, because if you really wanted to see wanted to re see something when we were kids, you had to work at it, right? And it's because that's human nature, sinful human nature, but now it's so accessible. And many men have been caught up in this, and it's very addictive. Even men in ministry have been lured into this and have lost their ministries or lost their marriages. And it starts with the eyes, and the Christian must exercise discipline over your eyes, and we're bombarded, aren't we? by illicit billboards and TV commercials and young lady jogs by while you're driving or a young man, whatever the case may be. And you live in, Vegas. And you live in Las Vegas, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, picked up a, a guy at the airport one time who was having counseling from out of town. He was having counseling in town at a church and I picked him up to bring him to the counseling and then brought him back to the airport. And he was dealing with sexual issues and he mentioned how the bill, like he just couldn't believe what he was seeing on the billboards that we kind of become blind to somewhat or, you know, they get us in trouble. So, you know what, uh, when you think about what comes through the eyes, just think about TV commercials just dealing with food. Oh. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times when there's a commercial and they they show a slice of pizza and the, it's stringy cheese is coming up and I go must have pizza yeah right <laughs> right away we're gonna have pizza for or pancakes you know and it's very seductive but you know and that's just food and that's why so many of us are overweight you know so you know what we're told at Weight Watchers when I happen to attend. You know, I do at Weight Watchers what a lot of you do here at church. I go, I hear what I'm supposed to do, and then I don't do it. <laughs> so we're told at Weight Watchers, if you go to a party, don't stand by the buffet table. You know, don't ask for, you know, temptation. Anyway, so here's the temptation. Come to bed with me. And, and we're told in 3910, and she spoke to Joseph day after day. There was no let up. You know, sin and enticement and temptation is that way. When I was a young Christian, I thought the longer I walked with the Lord, the less temptation I'd have. I just get so strong and nothing would bother me. You know, just walk along and, you know, but it doesn't. It just goes on and on and on. And, you know, you come to an age when you're older where you don't have the energy to do a lot of stuff, but you can sure eat, can't you? <laughs> You'll have refreshments afterward. Next week is our usual after church dining on steroids. So, <laughs> so Joseph is tempted by this young woman. It's, it's real. And he's in his prime and he's young and he's vigorous. He's all American or all Hebrew, and life has been unfair to him. You know, he'd been thrown into a pit. He'd been sold into slavery into a foreign country. He's missing home. And many of us would understand if he just gave in. Who could blame him? Man, you know, when you're down in certain ways, it makes, it makes doing things, you know, it makes the temptation stronger. You know, why not? I'm suffering, I'm going through this. But we, re we read this, but he refused in verses 8 and 9 of 39. He refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God. This is a remarkable young man. You know, last week we talked about some of his foolish behavior when he was a teenager, his faults. But in a very short time, we see something so admirable. 
Remember the incident with Monica Lewinsky and President uh, Bill Clinton? And how many times did we hear back then, what man doesn't? They, uh, there was a program with Bill Maher back then during those times. And Eartha Kitt, if you remember Eartha Kitt, was on, one of the, on the panel. And they were talking about the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton issue. And uh, Bill Maher said, does it matter when a man does something in the privacy of his own home? And Eartha said, yes, but I'm paying the rent on that home. It, it does matter, and not everybody jumps to bed. I think about a pastor friend of mine here in town that was a UNLV basketball star in the 90s. He, good-looking guy, still a uh, good-looking, tall guy, and had his choice of women, you know, as a basketball player and a, a star uh, in the area. And uh, he became a Christian, and he said that we went... Uh, they went out on a date one time and went back to the young lady's house and they were going to have sex. And he realized, no. And he, had, he told her, just like Joseph, sorry, can't go to bed with you. And, and the culture says, you know, it's not manly. But he had the courage. So not all men do that. W. Clement Stone said this, have the courage to say no. Have the courage to face the truth. Do the right thing because it is right. These are the magic keys to living your life with integrity. That's another amen spot. Amen. Let me hear it like you mean it. Amen. That's better. Now if I could just get you to do it on your own. <laughs> I got to train you. I have to train you like my dog, Pumpkin. You know, you have to do it over and over and over again. And you stick a little treat in your mouth. And then eventually his little eyes like open up and he gets like, he does it automatically, you know. I don't know, do I need treats? <laughs> Amen, yeah. <laughs> now, again, the first two messages as we looked at Joseph, we saw that his dad Jacob, Israel, made some mistakes. That favoritism, that obvious, you know, rewarding him and uh, neglecting the other brothers. But it's obvious from Joseph's character that Jacob did something right. He reared him in the love and the fear of God. And Joseph, Joseph makes it clear to Mrs. Potiphar that he would never consider, consider violating his master's faithfulness and his master's trust. And you know, many Christians constantly violate the trust of their employers. And I'll just leave that to you. A lot of you are, are uh, retired now. But so many times making personal calls on when you're being paid, spending time talking at the water cooler, these kind of things you're robbing your employer. Taking home office supplies. Oh, it's just a stapler. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I, my master trusts me and I won't take advantage of that. And he acknowledges that having sex with her would be a sin against God. He refers to this act of adultery as a wicked thing. You know, that's a word we need to use a lot more. Wicked. That's like beyond bad. You know what I mean? This would be a wicked thing. And he says, it's, it's, it's God I would be violating. God, not you, not me, not even my master. But I'd be sinning against God. David said in Psalm 51.4, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Man, we need that kind of a heart, that is that kind of tenderness to recognize, God, I've sinned against you. Joseph may have failed the test in the pit while he was back, but he succeeds in this area with absolutely flying colors. George Eliot said, our deeds determine us as much as we determine our deeds. Our deeds determine us as much as we determine our deeds. Say law. That's something to really chew on. This is who Joseph is when no one is looking. Now, we often struggle with that scripture I brought up earlier that Jesus said, if a man even looks with a woman, at a woman with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery. And we think, how can 
How can we not? You know what I mean? How can you keep from noticing this or that, you know, and being enticed? But I heard a teaching on that that I th think really made it clear, and it was this. If when you hear of this situation, or you're enticed, and it's just an enticement, it's just a temptation, and you think to yourself, if I had the opportunity, I'd do it. That's committing adultery. Not just noticing, you can't help notice, you can't help look, you know, sometimes. Corey Ten Boom always talked about, you can't help if a bird flies over your head, but you can keep from building a nest in your hair, you know. Yeah. So there's the difference. And what a contrast there is be between Joseph's heart and his brothers. Think of what his brothers did. They were going to kill him and they throw him in a pit, their own brother, their father's son, the hurt that they would cause their father. And then we see this character in, in Joseph. And you know what it says to us? They were all raised in a godly home. But it tells us that following Jesus with devotion is a very individual thing. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them with symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. It's to be all-consuming, but not everyone treats God as all-consuming and makes God the all-consuming fire. We don't see a heart for God as Joseph had in his brothers at all. And we have to remember that he is living this holy life without a Bible, without a church, without Christian fellowship, without Christian teaching on TV, radio, he just has that relationship. And the Lord's able to speak to his heart. The law is written on his heart. So Joseph did what every one of us should do in a situation where we're enticed. He ran. Run away. He got out of the heat before he got burned. Would we do the same when no one is watching? He did the right thing, and the situation got worse. And we'll talk about that next week. I thought obedience brought blessing. It does, eventually, not always right away, in God's plan. Romans 8, 28, 29, we're going to close with this, and then we're going to bring uh, Dale up to pray for him, and then we're going to, hear, we're going to close the service with Ron's poem. Romans 8, 28 and 29, for we know that in all things, imagine the situation Joseph is in, imagine some of the situations you're in, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. His purpose is knowing Christ, that's his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. All that Joseph went through, all that you and I go through, is for that purpose, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And as we continue on looking at Joseph, we'll see that he re looks remarkably like Jesus. Let's close in prayer. And then, Dale, if you'd come forward uh, as soon as I close the prayer, and if the elders would come forward, we're going to pray for Dale. He's getting ready to go uh, to a conference in Tennessee, and he wants the Lord's blessing on it. So. Father, we thank you for this time together. I pray, Lord, that everything I've said has touched hearts. And Lord, it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. We depend on you because we can do nothing apart from you. So bless the word, Lord, to the hearts of these people. Give us a hunger after you, Lord. Give us a passion for the things of God. Help us to live disciplined, holy, godly lives. We ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. A Thanksgiving paradox. We'll see if we can get through it somehow or another. Okay, every day should be for Thanksgiving. And I should be thankful for all that I've got. But listen, dear people, to just some of my complaints. And you'll understand why it is I am not. I don't have nice neighbors around me. 
Oh. All their dogs. All their dogs do their business on my grass. And their kids, they're, they're really atrocious. My poor dogs and cats, they harass. I'd like to throw nails on their sidewalks. And, but I hate wasting money like that. So I'll probably just break a few bottles. I know that'll give them a flat. Can't stand when they're what? Can't stand when they what? Can't stand when they play their loud music. It's offensive and it really hurts my ears. Well, I've thought of something real nasty to do that'll send their kids running home in tears. They call me a grouchy old man. Well, I call them monsters and brats. And I can hardly wait to hear their screams when on their lawns they find my piles of dead rats. <laughs> they roller skate up and down my sidewalk all day long, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. Well, I found a way to stop all that. To make that sidewalk real slick, she said. found a way to make that sidewalk real slick. So I listen, as their bones, they crack. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you know, may, may, maybe I, she said, do you know? So I have to find out if I know. Maybe I should be thankful. Sure, come on now. Don't you get it? Can't you see that I have more to be thankful for than anyone else? Because I'll never have to live next to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ron. What, what, is, what is that? Oh, 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 this is, let's see, for the people. This. This will give you something to think about. Uh, you are the salt. He made you so. He set you free, so you must go and pour out yourself. Sprinkle yourself on an unsaved man and thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. You're in his plan. Yes. Ron, did we finally come to the end of that epic? <laughs>